Are you looking for professional training in forensic mental health? Interviewing really needs to be thought of as a data gathering opportunity um, that may seem self-evident, and yet if you read transcripts of people's notes, and I will get back to how that occurs, um, you frequently find that people who are supposed to be doing forensic interviewing are not doing forensic interviewing. They are essentially sitting down with people and doing much the same thing that a treatment provider would do, which is to simply let people talk about what they want to talk about and let them ramble on whether it does or doesn't relate to the issue of custody. Um, and they don't seem to know how to focus the interview and so on. The goal is to obtain information bearing upon a specific psycholegal matter and not to be distracted by information that in a clinical context might be significant but fails to provide answers to the questions that are the focus of the litigation. So, the whole thing really needs to be looked at from what I refer to as a structural perspective. I, I call them basics and yet unfortunately there's a lot of evidence that some of our colleagues don't even know the basics. So I'm calling these fundamental elementary basics, <laughs> just to make the point. So, <clears throat> Jay will handle the tough stuff. You like my illustration, Jay? I do. <laughs> Psychological testing and custody litigation context. What are we looking for? Dispositional variables, depending upon what books you read, sometimes referred to as trait variables, that pertain to the issues before the court. What are the elements that may mislead us? Situational variables, also known as state variables, context-determined emotions, stated positions and behaviors, stuff that's really related directly to the litigation that may not have been present before the litigation started, may not be present after the litigation is over, um, and characteristics that do not pertain to the psycholegal issues before the court. And of course, one of the problems with psychological testing, broadly speaking, is that a, a lot of the information we gather is not directly related to what it is we're looking for. Because this is going to affect all the testing we're going to talk about. Response style. Response style pretty much is, um, there's two things that limit the accuracy of one is item transparency. David talked about that yesterday. And that is, if I look at an item, can I tell what it's measuring? Sometimes I feel down and depressed. Well, that's obviously measuring depression. Or um, I see little animals that nobody else sees. <laughs> it's obviously measuring something to do with psychosis. So item transparency, if an item is easy to see what it's measuring, it's also easy to avoid answering it if you want to protect yourself from looking like you have psychopathology. Simple. How often do I re retest? Rarely, and there's several reasons for that. One is the research on retest, um, there's some, some work by Butcher, and another one by, oh, it's in here, we'll get to it. But what happens is the person takes the test again. You have to have a specific instruction set. So by changing the instructions, you've already invalidated the test. To learn more about Concept's professional training opportunities, visit us at concept-ce.com.